This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 4, Mark chapter 1, verse 40, to chapter 2, verse 17. The public ministry continues. All right, good to be with you again. Uh, we're going to be getting into uh, Mark chapter 2 today, the, though there is part of the end of chapter 1. Uh, I want to get to before we do that. But just to take stock of things, uh, so far, the Gospel of Mark, our attention has been drawn to Jesus' authority. Uh, we saw it with the calling of the disciples. He called, uh, and they immediately came. Uh, we saw it in his teaching, how he uh, and that taught with an authority unlike the scribes. We, we saw it in the exorcisms, again, where Jesus spoke and, and they immediately obeyed. And even in the miracles, if you remember, when we were talking about Peter's mother-in-law, how she was uh, stricken with illness and, and then she was fully recovered. So that great day in Capernaum, which really was the attention of chapter 1, we uh, are, have launched into uh, the uh, Markan narrative properly. And therefore, I think it's important as we begin to still move through that we uh, remember the, the themes that were presented, namely that Jesus is the stronger one, uh, the one with the authority. And that is, of course, going to guide us through primarily the first eight chapters. And then we'll, we'll, we'll see this hinge, this switch, that will move to also now Jesus as the one who is to die. I mentioned last time that we would get into chapter 2, and, and we will. Uh, but there's a brief account at the end of chapter 1 that's after the day at Capernaum, uh, the Jesus healing of a leper. And I want to I look at that briefly because I think it, it does tell us quite a bit. And uh, I'll read it here from you, verses 40 through 45 of chapter 1, and then uh, we'll discuss it. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion... Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So this, this account of leprosy, probably to begin with it, we need to make sure we're understanding the context that we're, we're talking about. Now, leprosy here in the biblical times probably referred to a number of skin diseases, uh, not just what we today call Hansen's disease, uh, but it would have been um, you know, diseases that especially were marked by flesh dying away or decaying or some sort of rot being, being put in. Now, one of the things that we uh, understand here is leprosy had this idea almost of living death, that you were, even though the person was alive, they were showing signs of death. And in the Second Temple Judaism, uh, the death was an impure uh, state. You know, if one touched a corpse, there were regulations where one had to ritually cleanse themselves because death was considered, to touch death was um, carried with it a, an impurity. And we see this in the Old Testament. We see it in the, uh, old, the oral law that surround the Old Testament. So a leper, by definition, was ceremonially impure. And what this meant for a leper in the in the Jewish community at this time, was they would be separated from family, from friends. There would be no social interaction. Uh, there would be, uh, in essence, they would be living almost outside the community. Indeed, we know um, that from Leviticus 13 and Numbers 5 and then the oral tradition around it, that when a leper would start to come into any contact with uh, other people, they had to declare themselves to be unclean. They would have to announce their arrival by declaring their unclean state. It had to be a very horrible existence, if you, if you think about it. not only just the disease itself, but also the, the social loneliness that would have occurred. And, and, and the idea here that, of the purity laws was that holy and unholy, clean and unclean, uh, do not mix. 
and the holiness is, uh, whether the unholiness, the impurity is contagious. So something that is clean, if it comes into contact with something is unclean, it is the unclean part that has now moved into that which was clean and rendered it now unclean. So the unclean is contagious. There aren't a lot of uh, occasions of the curing of leprosy. Exodus 4, 2 Kings 5, a couple of examples there in the Old Testament. But by and large, it was considered an incurable disease. So I think knowing that, we see a couple of interesting things that begin to come out. First of all, what this man does coming up to Jesus uh, and, 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 and speaking to him and begging him would have itself been a, an act contrary to what was expected of someone stricken with leprosy, that he would approach a person uh, and come into that proximity uh, in that way. They were to steer clear and to, and to make path. And that is consistent with what we see in the Gospel of Mark, which is that great acts of coming to Jesus often require a kinetic display of faith, a, a muscular act. And so he is, he is doing in here that which he should not. Um, and, and then even the phrasing, notice it there in verse 40, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Uh, notice, first of all, it's not healed. It's clean because he understood that he was in a state of uncleanness uh, according to the, the Jewish ritual law. Uh, but even the phrasing is, is fascinating. Um, and I won't get into it too much, but in the Greek, there are different ways of structuring if-then statements. And one of the ways that we see uh, being structured here is the if part, if you will, is the uncertain part. Um, uh, it's uh, Jesus may be willing or he may not be willing. But if the condition is met, i.e., he is willing, then the outcome is certain. And so the way the Greek reads, it presents the if-then statement as if you are willing to do this, then the outcome is certain. So the uncertainty is... Uh, will Jesus choose to do it or not do it? Um, not can Jesus do it or not do it? Hope that hope that makes sense. And so when when he approaches him, he's he's, he's asking if Jesus will choose to uh, cleanse him, choose to make him uh, whole, if you will. And Jesus' response, I think, is fascinating. Filled with compassion, he reached out his hand and touched the man. Notice this reaching out of his hand and touching the man occurs before the miracle. Jesus is doing what he should not. Ceremonially, ritualistically, he should not touch this man. One of the things we will see as we work through the Gospel of Mark, that it isn't only the miracle that Jesus does that is uh, important, but the manner in which he chooses to do the miracle that is also important. We know, uh, we know from the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus has the abilities to heal over a distance. We know that he doesn't always have to touch to heal, that, uh, that his powers he can speak, we'll see in the storms, or he just can speak and something occurs. We've already seen that in the exorcisms. So presumably, he could have simply said to the man with leprosy, you know, I'm willing, be clean. And that would have, that would have been sufficient. But instead, Jesus choose, chose to touch him. And I think that's important for, for it says a couple of things. One, it just once again reveals the tenderness. It's filled with compassion. He touched this man. One, one could only wonder how long it had been since this man had actually felt a tender touch from another. But also, going back to our point of uh, impurity being contagious, that unclean and clean do not mix. And when clean touches unclean, well, the unclean was the stronger force. Well, going back to that idea, we see here with Jesus the opposite happening. Again, holy and unholy do not mix. Clean and unclean do not mix. But with, but with Jesus, it is the holiness, the cleanness, if you will, the purity of Jesus that is the contagious factor. The, the leper becomes cleansed by being in contact with Jesus rather than what one would have expected in, the, in, the, in that culture, which is Jesus becoming unclean by touching 
the man with leprosy. And so Jesus reached out, he, 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 dis- he affirms he's willing and, and says, be clean. Again, we see what we have seen, this idea of speaking, and it occurs. And as, as the pattern is with Mark, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Now, interesting enough, the story doesn't end there. Uh, there is uh, um, a little bit more. We get Jesus gives him instructions, uh, actually a very strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. Now, we have to understand, uh, I don't think Jesus is oblivious to the fact that people are going to see that this man no longer has living, you know, decayed flesh. I think the idea is um, he needs to do something first before he begins and just starts telling people what has occurred. And specifically, Jesus instructs him to go show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Well, in the practices of this time, what was necessary for one to re-enter the community, for one to be sanctioned now as clean, was to have uh, the the priests, uh, the religious leaders, affirm. Uh, Often they would do the uh, ritualistic rite themselves, or at least bear witness to the fact that the individual was no longer in a um, unclean state. And so I think what Jesus is telling him, uh, the leper, to do is to go through now the process that is prescribed to um, uh, allow for full now involvement and acceptance back into the community, that he's to go and show himself that he no longer is bearing the marks of, of a living death, uh, if you will, and, and now is, is, is fully clean. And so this language as a testimony to them I don't think it's as much as a testimony to what uh, Jesus has done, per se, but as a testimony to them that uh, the leper is fully cleansed. As, as one of the things we'll see in Mark, um, uh, Jesus commands to be silent uh, or to delay, aren't always obeyed. Uh, and so this man immediately uh, began to talk freely and spread the news. And, and one, one understands that. I can understand why he would, he would do so. Uh, it is interesting that the first thing that occurs after a great healing um, and in such a powerful way uh, is an act of disobedience, uh, even if it's sort of understood. Uh, but there's a result. Uh, and uh, the result is Jesus could no longer go opening his, uh, openly to the towns because, again, news was starting to spread around this area of, of here is this one who is has leprosy, an incurable disease, who now has immediately been made whole at the, at the words of Jesus. Um, and so I think we get a glimpse, too, of one of the motivations of why Jesus always tried to um, dampen a little bit uh, or control or direct a little bit the spread of his fame is because it did, it, it, it did hinder some of his abilities. Uh, so as Mark tells us, uh, as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly but stayed outside. Um, Yet people still came for him from everywhere. So I just wanted to spend just a little bit of time there looking at uh, Jesus and the leper because I think it speaks to a couple of the themes we're going to be seeing. Of course, it continues Jesus' authority, his ability to speak and make happen. But we're also now engaging in in purity and impurity uh, in the Old Testament community and the ritualistic law and Jesus' relationship uh, to purity and impurity. Uh, That's going to sort of set the stage for some of the things we're going to find. All right, let's move into to chapter 2. Uh, with chapter 2, uh, we, we continue sort of working through these um, uh, healings, these miracles uh, that Jesus has, has been doing, and we get the, uh, the, the famous story of the paralyzed man in verses 1 through 12. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, have it for us here with verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, So he's come back. The people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was so many gathered that there was no room left, none even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat, uh, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So here we have the setting. So Jesus has circled back to Capernaum. He's probably at Peter's house. Right? This is, seems to be the house that he was staying at. Word got around, as, as one would expect, that he had gone home. And so we have uh, uh, this, this um, crowd starting to develop. And notice again, we continue to see Mark interweave teaching and uh, miracles or teaching and exorcisms or healings uh, and um, uh, you know um, uh, exorcisms we see we see this interweaving of the big three right which is teaching healing and exorcisms he'll constantly and continually interweave this so here Jesus um, last time when he was at Capernaum at this house if you remember they were bringing him you know, everyone who had some sort of disease or was possessed by demon, and he was doing many, many things. Um, and then he said he needed to, to move on. Here he's teaching. So the scene, they're still crowding around the house, but they're receiving his teaching. And, and I always find it interesting, one of the characteristics of the crowds, if you will, in the Gospel of Mark, is they get in the way. They block doorways. They are constantly preventing people, if you will, from uh, getting to Jesus. And so as we're looking at this, we see, again, an example of, of muscular faith. Here are these men. They're carrying a paralytic uh, on a mat, uh, one, who, one who is unable to walk. And because of the crowd that's at the door, uh, they must find another way into this house. And so they, they make the decision to climb up. There would be stairs that would come alongside uh, the outside of these uh, houses. And, and they would go up those stairs and then... Um, begin to attempt to lower uh, the man to Jesus. The only way they could get to him thus was through the roof. So as we think about these four men, and notice it's the actions of the four men, and I think that's important, we'll see. The the paralytic man is, is not really credited with doing anything at this point. Now, presumably he encouraged this and was for this and wanted to get to Jesus as well, to Jesus as well. but it's the four men who are doing this uh, action. Um, and they're, they're even destroying property. They're digging through the roof, and the digging would have been the right idea. Um, the, the roof would have been uh, made of uh, some sort of thatch material, and so to open it up, you literally would almost be digging uh, the hole, to which they do, and, and, they, and they lower them down. Palestinian roofs were flat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here are these men. They, they go upside, outside. They dig through the roof. They lower the man down, and then, and then Jesus says in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, so he's talking about the whole group, their faith, their trust, their willingness to get around the obstacles to get to Jesus, he said to the paralytic, notice there's a shift here, he said to the paralytic, it doesn't say he said to them, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. So the, the concern here by the man was his inabilities to walk. He was paralyzed. Yet what Jesus says to him is, your sins are forgiven. We had the leper who had, <coughs> excuse me, who had a, a skin disease that was associated with cultic impurity. And here we have a, 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 a paralyzed man whom Jesus now has made a statement about his sins. And, and I think this uh, statement is linking is important, going back to our idea that Jesus is very deliberate in his actions when he does something miraculous. He did not need to say, your sins are forgiven, to heal this man. He chose to say, uh, your sins are forgiven. So what is this relationship that, that Jesus is, is wanting to make? Well, of course, uh, you know, there was uh, some... Uh, thought during 
Second Temple Judaism, that if you were suffering of some sort, it must be the result of sin. There must be something you've done to anger God that has led to you being uh, stricken in a certain way. We see that pop up here and again. So, it, you know, it's possible that um, people are understanding Jesus maybe to make that type of connection. But I think we could probably move beyond that because I don't think it's exactly what he's doing. He doesn't name a particular sin. He doesn't say a specific sin. He just says your sin is forgiven. Now, without a doubt, the man's physical state was the result of sin. But understand what I'm saying. It's not the result of a particular sin of which now judgment is being rendered upon him. It's not the the case that the man who is paralyzed did something and then God said, oh, well, because of that, I'm now stricken you um, with paralysis. But rather that all physical ailments of any sort is the result of sin. That when when God created and the world was good, it was without sin. But when sin entered into the world through the trans of Adam and Eve when in the story of Genesis, when sin entered, so came death and, and the decaying of the world. And so in a, in, in a lot of ways, this paralysis as anybody's sickness, is the cough that I, that I have here today, that's a result of sin, of particular, um, uh, a particular um, judgment and, and that happened when sin entered the world. So I think what Jesus is saying here, that he is about to make an example that not only does he have the power to undo the symptoms of the fall, illnesses, for example, but that even uh, the cause of those symptoms, namely the problem of sin in general, he can remedy the cause of the illness, not just the symptom. So here, here Jesus uh, says, your, sins, your sin, son, your sin is, is forgiven, which is, a, uh, I think, a fantastic interplay, but a very purposeful one. Now, as you would expect, there are teachers of the law sitting there, which I think is interesting. Um, they're in this position. They're in the house. The teachers of the law did not have trouble getting good seats. Uh, they, they seem to find a way to get into the house. Um, Probably there's a respect for their position, uh, and people gave way. So they were sitting and listening to his teaching. Remember, he's been teaching at this point. Uh, This is what has been occurring. And they're listening to him, and they hear him say, Son, uh, your sins are forgiven. And then naturally, they become very uh, upset about this. Because Jesus' statement seems to uh, be... Uh, de- declaring something that was beyond his prerogative. Not only um, was he just issuing a statement about the forgiveness of sins, he was doing so unaccompanied by uh, any uh, sort of atonement sacrifice that might have been expected. This was something priests could declare that sins have been atoned for because sacrifice has been done in keeping with the law. But here was Jesus simply saying, your, you know, your sins are forgiven. And so they begin... Uh, to, to talk among themselves, um, uh, and you know, who can forgive sins but God alone? He's blaspheming. Why does he talk um, you know, like he does? This is all in the context of the same town where the people marveled that Jesus taught with an authority unlike the scribes. And here's a statement that Jesus is making that is very much unlike what the scribes would, would ever do. And then we get this statement that immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And I think that's a very important bit of information that we're given there. Because the tension in the story is, is Jesus blasphemy? Has Jesus done something that only God can do? That's the question being asked. Uh, the Pharisees and the scribes are asking the question, you know, how, you know, he is, um, who can forgive sins but God alone? Even the, the, the sacrificial system that was in place was in place because God directed that sacrificial system and said he, that if one followed this system, uh, the Day of Atonement, etc., then temporary forgiveness of sins would be available to the people. 
So again, it was always a God-designed ritual. Well, here we have this tension in the story. Can Jesus do something that only God is supposed to do? Is he truly blaspheming or not? And then Mark tells us that Jesus knows what they're saying in their hearts. That is something that only God can do. So as we've just had a statement, your sins are forgiven. Before we even see the miracle, Mark has told us that 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 statement has been effective because Jesus indeed does have the power to do that which only God can do. He has the power to know what someone is saying in their hearts. And so he, he says, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk? I find that question a bit um, funny because to some extent, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven than it is to say, take up your mat and walk. And by that, I mean, uh, yeah, you're not, you don't necessarily see the reality of saying your sins are, are forgiven like one would expect to say, see when you tell one to get up the mat, take up the mat and walk. But the logic of it essentially is, uh, there's an impossibility associated with both, and Jesus is presenting one as evidence of the other. That the, the, to say uh, to a paralytic, take up your mat and walk, Jesus is linking that moment to his statement of the forgiveness of sins. He's linking the two. So that the, what's about to occur to the paralytic is really an evidence, a, a, a visual portrayal of an internal change. He has declared that he wants to link them. And so he says, um, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And so here is this paralyzed man, and immediately restored. The, 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 the healing of the paralyzed man is, again, what we've been seeing in the Gospel of Mark. There isn't a process. He doesn't, he doesn't have a bit of a sort of clumsy start. Um, his legs, you would assume, would have been fully atrophied that there would have been very little muscular act, yet he is able to get up, pick up his mat, and walk home. A full restoration. And so it isn't just he can now walk, he can walk in full strength. And, and that becomes the picture. The miracle serves the statement, your sins are forgiven. So he saw this great act of which the paralyzed man contributed Nothing physically, too. It was the four men who physically did it. Yet, in seeing their faith, he takes that moment to present an incredible display of his authority, not only to heal, but his authority to forgive sins, because Jesus has linked the two. What this means is that in in the declaration, your sins are forgiven, it is a full, complete Declaration in the same sense that this man is able is able to now fully get up and walk, and he does. He t- he gets up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this does what? It amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, "We have never seen anything like this." Very similar to what they said uh, in the synagogue. Uh, who is like this? That even the evil spirits. Obey him. So there's this, this. There's a difference. You know, the those who will want to locate Jesus' ability to do miracles and make them similar uh, to other figures. Uh, notice the, the Gospel of Mark is saying the crowds see a big difference. They've seen nothing like this. And so as we as we continue through uh, into chapter two, uh, you know, of course, what we've been seeing is is Jesus do these wonderful, miraculous acts, but with some uh, tension involved. There was a, uh, the the leper, now cleansed, go show the religious leaders. The religious leaders wondering if, you know, this seems like blasphemy to to forgive sins. And, And here Jesus, in full display of them sitting around here, says, your sins are forgiven, and then also announces he knows what's in their hearts. So we're getting this growing tension in the middle of all this authority. We're getting this growing tension of this relationship 
that is happening between Jesus and the religious editor, our religious leaders. Something we're going to see here with the call of Levi and the eating uh, with sinners in verses 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd uh, came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi's son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. We likely here have two separate stories that have been uh, put together. One is the calling of Levi, and then the second is what happens at Levi's house. Likely you could see why they would be put together, Levi being... um, uh, uh, the same figure in both. And, and, and Luke very clearly blends these together. Now, it's interesting enough, the name of Levi for a disciple only occurs here and in Luke 5, 27-32. Um, the reference to the son of Alphaeus suggests Mark does indeed have a very specific person in mind. Um, when you look at the different lists, this is where things become very interesting. Uh, Levi is not mentioned in Luke's list of the twelve. You see that in Luke 6. But James, the son of Alphaeus, is. Matthew does not mention a Levi, but he does mention a Matthew right before he mentions James, the son of Alphaeus. And so it seems that we are perhaps dealing uh, with the same figure. In fact, Matthew 9 presents a story of, of Levi as the story of the call of Matthew. Very similar. So we probably have this same person who went by both Levi and and Matthew had a a double name of source, which would not be uncommon uh, back then to have more than than one name. A couple other interesting things. The first two sets of disciples called by Jesus were two pairs of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And so thus it's possible that Levi and James are two sons of Alphaeus. So again, we have two pairs of brothers that are being um, put together. And then Luke seems to work this way. So if we, if we have Levi as this figure, also we know as Matthew is who is being described here, the, the call of Levi is, is very interesting. It would have presumably happened um, uh, near the city, uh, depending on whether he was a toll collector sitting on the border between two regions um, or uh, a tax farmer who uh, you know, lived in the city. Those were sort of the different types of, of options. It's probably here, though, not someone who collected income taxes, um, is most likely a customs official of some sort, given this language of sitting at the table. So here's how this would work. If you wanted to bring your goods into market, you would have to pay uh, a customs official a toll to be allowed to come bring them uh, them into the city. And and these figures would then, these these people would, some of their collections, they, they had a, uh, a nut they had to pay, they had to, to, they had to get up to uh, the Roman officials who would be involved, and then they would, whatever else they collected was you know, part of their own earnings. And, and they were despised individuals, considered traitors. The Talmud, for example, um, lists tax collectors among murderers and thieves in terms of how, you know, the types of harms they did to people. You know, they made the limmy from the extra they charged on top of what they owed. Now, often one got this job um, by bidding for it. You know, that you, you, you um, either you got it by connections that was made or by um, offering the abilities to, to gain or collect more. And so if you, you would get this position uh, by being able to say you could get more money up to the ruling authorities, to the Romans, uh, perhaps here. Uh, and so... You could see why Levi would be such a despised person. And if this is in Capernaum, it likely meant he was a tax collector 
on the fishing industry as well. So think of this. Here you have Simon and Andrew and James and John, individuals who were, were involved in fishing. This is a house familiar to Simon. Right? There, there might have even been opportunities they would have sought to bring fish into market. And they would have routinely had to engage with figures like Levi, if not Levi himself. It, this, this, uh, this was not a figure who, by his profession, Simon, Andrew, James, and John would have thought this is really good. This is the type of people we need to recruit. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we think through what happens next. But notice Jesus says, follow me. The, Mark words it very, the very same as it does with the calls of the other disciples. Levi doesn't get a distinctly different call. He gets the same call, the same summary, follow me, and the same response, Levi got up and followed him. So just as Simon and Andrew and James and John heard, follow me, and left their boats and followed him, uh, you know, Levi hears, follow me, and gets up and follows him. Now, there may have been process involved. There may have been other conversation. There may have been other moments. Uh, Mark uh, doesn't give us that information, but what Mark, by doing it this way, What Mark wants us to know is that there is nothing substantially different about the calling of Levi or the response of Levi than there was with the calling and the response of the others. And so then after uh, this call, we have a a banquet. Jesus is having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners, and, and it's interesting, my translation puts sinners in quotes, were eating with him and his disciples for there were many who followed him. I want to talk just a little bit about what we probably have going on here. We have a a banquet um, that's been arranged by Levi, maybe to celebrate uh, what what is happening. Um, And Jesus is being accused of banqueting with bad people. Um, They're they're having a Greco-Roman style meal where they're reclining uh, this would have been uh, sort of the dining practices that's being perceived. He's being accused of banqueting with bad people. And I want to talk about the bad people here. Because it's repeatedly tax collectors and sinners. Sinners and tax collectors. Tax collectors and sinners. That's the arrangement. And, and the question becomes, how are we to make, what are we to make of that statement, tax collectors and sinners? Sinners, is that simply a way of saying tax collectors and a bunch of other people who sin? Or is something more specific in mind? And, and I think just the way the language and the stressing of the tax collectors, because it isn't Jesus was eating with sinners, but was eating with tax collectors and sinners. So I think there are two possible options. One is uh, there are just so many tax collectors in that room that that category was worth noting. We've already talked about how this, the, cat, the idea of a tax collector was considered um, uh, despicable. So maybe there were so many of them that it's just worth noting. That's one, that's one option. Another option might be, and this is where I tend to go, is that tax, the term tax collectors here, by stressing it, is helping us understand what is meant by the term sinners. Here's what I mean by that. That a tax collector's vocation was by definition considered a sinful vocation. They were uh, exploiting people, robbing people. You know, uh, There was a bit of extortion that was in view. And if you played out that they were doing this against the Jewish people um, you know, for the benefit of, of, of Gentile uh, rulers or the benefit of Jewish rulers that were considered... Uh, um, uh, immoral and unethical, and unethical, the idea would be if you called someone a tax collector, you also, by definition, were calling them a sinner because of their vocation. And I wonder if that is what is happening here, that, that this sinners group, which, which the translation I'm looking at, puts in quotes, and I think for good reason, that this sinners group is comprised of people who, by definition of their vocation, would have been considered sinners. So perhaps these would be people who were um, paid to physically harm other people. 
prostitutes would be a, another example. That we have at this gathering those who, it isn't simply uh, uh, tax collectors and gossipers and, and liars and slanderers, but tax collectors and then list whatever other vocation which made you by definition in that culture a sinner. Uh, that, that those are the groups that are being stressed. Uh, it's just one of the, one of the ways of, of thinking about it, but it seems to, to fit here. And so we have this situation where, where Jesus is, is eating with them. And I think when we talk about dining fellowship, table fellowship, uh, table fellowship is one of the most important concerns in the ancient world. The idea um, of uh, purity and impurity on dining we're, we're going to see come up time and time again in the Gospel of Mark. But, but even more so, table fellowship conveyed honor and shame. Who you ate with was a declaration of your value, of your worth, of your honor, or conversely, of your shame, of your lowliness. Think of it like in terms of the leper. That the leper was unclean and his uh, state was considered to be contagious until he was in the company of Jesus and Jesus' purity was the stronger. That's what happened in table fellowship. Like, you, you would... It was very important in a social status of who you ate with because if you ate with people who had lower honor in that culture, your honor yourself was lowered. If you ate with people who were unclean, your purity state would be challenged. And so for, for Jesus to be eating with those who should be shamed by Jesus, who Jesus should be avoiding in that culture, and second, you know, the, from, the, from the religious leader's point of view, um, Jesus, in a sense, was doing socially uh, what is akin to what happened with the leper in terms of purity and impurity. He is, he is being someplace he should not. And so we have this challenge, and this challenge is a challenge that we will get time and time again. The Pharisees saw him, uh, and they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? We get this interplay a lot between the Pharisees and Jesus and the disciples, where Jesus will, well, the Pharisees may ask Jesus, but why the disciples are doing something that they should not be doing, or they're asked the disciples why Jesus is doing something he should not be doing. There's this sort of indirect attack. And of course, the implication is always the same, um, that one party is in the wrong and potentially influencing the other. And by asking the disciples, uh, there is this measure of trying to bring to the disciples' attention, look what... Jesus is doing, uh, implying, surely uh, you do not agree with this. Surely this bothers you. Surely he is not worthy of being a leader. Look what he is. He is eating with those with he should not. Jesus, hearing this, said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. This is not uh, an uncommon proverb here. Uh, you know, this proverbial saying that Jesus is quoting isn't unknown. There are different versions of that type of statement throughout um, uh, uh, the ancient world. Um, but the idea here is that uh, to recover the ill are those in need of treatment, then it's necessary to go to those who are ill and in need of treatment. The extension being to go to those who are, by definition, outside of the law and it is necessary maybe to abrogate or transcend certain Old Testament provisions or, if you will, oral traditions around them. It's necessary to do which might not be considered socially acceptable because that is where the unacceptable are. Um, and so Jesus is claiming that he's come for the sinners, the lost, the immoral people. This That he is where, just as a doctor is to be among the sick, he is as well. Uh, and, and there might even be a tongue of cheek of, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. There might even be a bit of irony there, because the Pharisees, the, the entire hint of their criticism is they think they're righteous, uh, and these sinners are not, and Jesus is saying he is here um, uh, for the sinners, not the righteous. There may be a hint of uh, rejection um, or subtle irony as well. This is so far what we're seeing move through uh, chapter 2. We'll continue working through chapter 2 um, at our next time. Thank you. Elf. 
it, this, this, uh, this was not a figure who, by his profession, Simon, Andrew, James, and John would have thought this is really good. This is the type of people we need to recruit. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we think through what happens next. But notice Jesus says, follow me. The, Mark words it very, the very same as it does with the calls of the other disciples. Levi doesn't get a distinctly different call. He gets the same call, the same summary, follow me, and the same response, Levi got up and followed him. So just as Simon and Andrew and James and John heard, follow me, and left their boats and followed him, uh, you know, Levi hears, follow me, and gets up and follows him. Now, there may have been process involved. There may have been other conversation. There may have been other moments. Uh, Mark uh, doesn't give us that information, but what Mark, by doing it this way, what Mark wants us to know is that there is nothing substantially different about the calling of Levi or the response of Levi than there was with the calling and the response of the others. And so then after uh, this call, we have a, a banquet. Jesus is having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners, and, and it's interesting, my translation puts sinners in quotes, were eating with him and his disciples for there were many who followed him. I want to talk just a little bit about what we probably have going on here. We have a, a banquet um, that's been arranged by Levi, maybe to celebrate uh, you know, what, what is happening. Um, and Jesus is being accused of banqueting with bad people. Um, you know, they're, they're having a Greco-Roman style meal where they're reclining uh, this would have been uh, sort of the dining practices that's being perceived. He's being accused of banqueting with bad people. And I want to talk about the bad people here. Because it's repeatedly tax collectors and sinners. Sinners and tax collectors. Tax collectors and sinners. That's the arrangement. And, and the question becomes, how are we to make, what are we to make of that statement, tax collectors and sinners? Sinners, is that simply a way of saying tax collectors and a bunch of other people who sin? Or is something more specific in mind? And, and I think just the way the language and the stressing of the tax collectors, because it isn't Jesus was eating with sinners, but was eating with tax collectors and sinners. So I think there are two possible options. One is uh, there are just so many tax collectors in that room that that category was worth noting. We've already talked about how this, the, cat, the idea of a tax collector was considered um, uh, despicable. So maybe there were so many of them that it's just worth noting. That's one, that's one option. Another option might be, and this is where I tend to go, is that tax, the term tax collectors here, by stressing it, is helping us understand what is meant by the term sinners. Here's what I mean by that. That a tax collector's vocation was by definition considered a sinful vocation. They were uh, exploiting people, robbing people. You know, uh, There was a bit of extortion that was in view. And if you played out that they were doing this against the Jewish people um, you know, for the benefit of, of, of Gentile uh, rulers or the benefit of Jewish rulers that were considered... Uh, um, uh, immoral and uneth- unethical, the idea would be if you called someone a tax collector, you also, by definition, were calling them a sinner because of their vocation. And I wonder if that is what is happening here, that, that this sinners group, which, which the translation I'm looking at, puts in quotes, and I think for good reason, that this sinners group is comprised of people who, by definition of their vocation, would have been considered sinners. So perhaps these would be people who were um, paid to physically harm other people. Prostitutes would be a- another example. That we have at this gathering those who, it isn't simply uh, uh, tax collectors and gossipers and, and liars and slanderers, but tax collectors and then list whatever other vocation which made you by definition in that culture a sinner. Uh, that, that those are the groups that are being stressed. Uh, it's just one of the, one of the ways of, of thinking about it, but it seems to, to fit here. 
And so we have this situation where, where Jesus is, is eating with them. And I think when we talk about dining fellowship, table fellowship, uh, table fellowship is one of the most important concerns in the ancient world. The idea um, of uh, purity and impurity on dining we're, we're going to see come up time and time again in the Gospel of Mark. But, but even more so, table fellowship conveyed honor and shame. Who you ate with was a declaration of your value, of your worth, of your honor, or conversely, of your shame, of your lowliness. Think of it like in terms of the leper. That the leper was unclean and his uh, state was considered to be contagious until he was in the company of Jesus and Jesus' purity was the stronger. That's what happened in table fellowship. Like, you, you would... It was very important in a social status of who you ate with because if you ate with people who had lower honor in that culture, your honor yourself was lowered. If you ate with people who were unclean, your purity state would be challenged. And so for, for Jesus to be eating with those who should be shamed by Jesus, who Jesus should be avoiding in that culture, and second, you know, the, from, the, from the religious leader's point of view, um, Jesus, in a sense, was doing socially uh, what is akin to what happened with the leper in terms of purity and impurity. He is, he is being someplace he should not. And so we have this challenge, and this challenge is a challenge that we will get time and time again. The Pharisees saw him, uh, and they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? We get this interplay a lot between the Pharisees and Jesus and the disciples, where Jesus will, well, the Pharisees may ask Jesus, but why the disciples are doing something that they should not be doing, or they'll ask the disciples why Jesus is doing something he should not be doing. There's this sort of indirect attack. And of course, the implication is always the same, um, that one party is in the wrong and potentially influencing the other. And by asking the disciples, uh, there is this measure of trying to bring to the disciples' attention, look what Jesus is doing, uh, implying, surely uh, you do not agree with this. Surely this bothers you. Surely he is not worthy of being a leader. Look what he is, he is eating with those with he should not. Jesus, hearing this, said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. This is not uh, an uncommon proverb here. Uh, you know, this proverbial saying that Jesus is quoting isn't unknown. There are different versions of that type of statement throughout um, uh, uh, the ancient world. Um, but the idea here is that uh, to recover the ill are those in need of treatment, then it's necessary to go to those who are ill and in need of treatment. The extension being to go to those who are, by definition, outside of the law And it is necessary maybe to abrogate or transcend certain Old Testament provisions or, if you will, oral traditions around them. It's necessary to do which might not be considered socially acceptable because that is where the unacceptable are. Um, And so Jesus is claiming that he's come for the sinners, the lost, the immoral people. This That he is where, just as a doctor is to be among the sick, he is as well. Uh, and, and there might even be a tongue of cheek of, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. There might even be a bit of irony there, because the Pharisees, the, the entire hint of their criticism is they think they're righteous, uh, and these sinners are not, and Jesus is saying he is here um, uh, for the sinners, not the righteous. There may be a hint of uh, rejection um, or subtle irony as well. This is so far what we're seeing move through uh, chapter 2. We'll continue working through chapter 2 um, at our next time. Thank you. This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 4, Mark chapter 1, verse 40, to chapter 2, verse 17. The public ministry continues.